answers that they got. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, the situation in Kenya during the Mau Mau uprising when many uh, frightened uh, whites in Kenya, Africa, would go among the Africans and ask them, what about the Mau Mau? And the African would say, I never heard of them. And the same white man who would ask the African this question and very naively believe what the African said, when he went to bed that night, he would lose his head. And usually the one who took his head was the same African who told him that afternoon he had never heard of the Mau Mau. <laughs> Welcome to the door the com. The door, it's a platform where you can buy and send anything, Purchase anytime, anywhere. Today. Making money easily. It's swift, secure, and easy. Dad all transforming lives. The charge of violence against us actually stems from the guilt complex that exists in the conscious and subconscious minds of most white people in this country. They know that they've been violent in their brutality against Negroes. And they feel that someday the Negro is going to wake up and try and do unto them as they have done unto, do unto the whites as the whites have done unto us. We aren't a violent group. We do, uh, we are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to be, to obey the law, to respect everyone who respects us. We're taught to display courtesy, to be polite. But we're also taught that at any time, anyone in any way uh, inflicts or seeks to inflict violence upon us, we are within our religious rights to retaliate in self-defense to the maximum degree of our ability. We never initiate any violence upon anyone. But if anyone attacks us, we reserve the right to defend ourselves. So to accuse us of, of being violent is like accusing a man who is being lynched, who is being hung on a tree, uh, simply because he struggles vigorously against his lyncher. The victim is accused of violence, but the lyncher is never accused of violence. And I only point this out because the various racist groups that are set up in this country by whites and who have actually practiced violence against blacks for 400 years are never associated or identified or made synonymous with the term violence. But whites speak of Muslims almost synonymously with violence. Whenever Muslims are mentioned by them, violence is brought up. But, not, but it's not connected with any other group. This is a sort of a propaganda tactic or what I would call psychological warfare to uh, in some way make uh, the image of the Muslims in this country be a violent image rather than a religious image. And, uh, on, but on the other hand, when we see our people being brutalized by white bigots, white racists, uh, we think that they are foolish to allow themselves to be beaten and brutalized and do nothing whatsoever to protect themselves. They are foolish. They, have, if they should have the right to, de to defend themselves against any attack made against them by anyone. If a dog is biting a black man, the black man should kill the dog. Whether the, the dog is a police dog, a hound dog, or any kind of dog. If a dog is sick on a black man, when that black man is doing nothing but trying to uh, take advantage of what the government says is supposed to be his, then that black man should kill that dog or any two-legged dog who sticks the dog on it. Should other black men help that particular person who was attacked? I think you'll find, sir, that there will come a time when black people wake up and become intellectually independent enough to think for themselves as other humans are intellectually independent enough to think for themselves, then the black man will think like a black man. And he will feel for other black people. And this new thinking and feeling will cause black people to stick together. And then at that point, you'll have a situation where when you attack one black man, you are attacking all black men. And this 
type of black thinking will cause all black people to stick together. And this type of thinking also will bring an end to the brutality inflicted upon black people by white people. And it is the only thing that will bring an end to it. No federal court, state court, or city court will bring an end to it. It's something that the black man has to bring an end to himself. What is it, in your judgment, that has caused this tremendous amount of support that the Nation of Islam has garnered in the Negro community in, say, the last 10 years? When you put a seed in the soil, it remains beneath the soil until the season changes. And, and when the season changes, that the seasonal change automatically brings about uh, rather atmospheric conditions bring about a seasonal change that makes that seed come up or crop grow uh, in its appointed time. And all over this world today, God himself has brought about political uh, changes, a political atmosphere, sociological, social atmosphere, um, economic atmosphere. These economic conditions, these political conditions and social conditions uh, combine to bring about a situation that is making black people in America more receptive, their mind more fertile to the seed of truth that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been planting for 30 some years. And this is springing up today and causing our people to see and understand now what they couldn't see and understand before. What is the nature of this situation which is making black people more receptive? The, well, you take, uh, the, in the past, say, 15 years, how uh, the nations have emerged, dark nations have emerged in, in Africa. Uh, prior to 10 years ago, most Negroes associated or identified Africa with a savage, jungle-like place. And whenever you mentioned the word African in their mind's eye, they could see the image of a, someone running around with a spear, uh, with no language. You'd say, ugga bugga boo, or buana, or something and uh, who'd be in a jungle running from lions or chasing lions. But then when, uh, after the war, when the United Nations was set up in New York City, uh, black people began to look at uh, uh, men like Tom Mboya. They began to look at men like uh, Nkrumah. They began to see men like Lumumba. They began to see men like Nasser. They began to see uh, these uh, Belawa and Azikwe who could uh, exchange intellectually with whites on an international level in a political form and hold their own. This made the black people in this country realize that what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had been teaching all the time actually had substance. And they began to turn it over in their mind and see that what he was saying had more weight to it than what these other uh, Negroes were saying. And they began to identify themselves with the black world and the black struggle more uh, closely than they identified themselves with this so-called white world. Let me ask you a question with respect to a statement which Essien Yudum quotes as being on a bulletin board in the University of Islam in Chicago by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. According to Essien, Mr. Muhammad states, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you willed. Build your future on these foundations, freedom, justice, and equality. What is the definition of freedom, justice, and equality for the black man, and where and when is it to be attained? Well, take equality first. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't teach us to uh, associate equality with whites. Equality has nothing to do with whites. We, want e we don't want to be equal with the white man. He's not the criteria or yardstick by which equality is measured. He's not in a position to tell us we are equal. It's not his right. It's not his to do. Equality, we want equality. We had equality before the white man was created. We had, the, we had equality before the white man came into existence. And we want equality whether the white man is on this earth or not. Equality means the uh, opportunity to develop all of our dormant potential, all, all of our dormant capability. And, and, and uh, in developing this dormant uh, capability, the right and the ability to stand on this earth on some land uh, of our own and bring about a civilization and a society 
in, we will, in which we will be completely independent, complete freedom to uh, uh, take care of the needs, to take care of the uh, wants and the likes and the dislikes of our people, to establish our own nation, our own society, our own heaven, our own future. This is what we mean by freedom, by uh, equality, and justice means uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. If you do wrong, you'll get wrong in return. And if you do right, you'll get right in return. When you're in your own nation, in your own land, you're in a position to get justice. But when you're in another man's country, in another man's land, under another man's flag, and under another man's uh, 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 government, and under another man's court system, you have to look to that other man for justice, and you'll never get it. And Negroes in this country probably are authorities on that. To say then that the United States is not the black man's country. Definitely American not. laws no, are no. not black men's laws. No. So, I, uh, American laws are not the black man's laws. Well, the, the uh, laws here in America were made white by white people for the benefit of white people. The Constitution was written by whites for the benefit of whites. It was never written for the benefit of blacks. And, and when you read the Constitution, I think in Article 1, se uh, Section Article 1, Section 2, or Section 1, Article 1, some one of the two, and it's in the Constitution. It says that uh, it classifies black people as three-fifths of a man. Three-fifths of a man, subhuman, less than a human being. It relegates us to the level of cattle, hogs, chickens, cows, a commodity that could be bought and sold at the will of the master. No, it was written by whites for the benefit of whites and to the detriment of blacks. And when a black man stands up talking about his constitutional rights, he's out of his mind. Except uh, in the Newsweek poll, they used Negro interviewers. You'll find that oftentimes Negroes are as much on guard uh, around Negro interviewers, who usually represent the bourgeois uh, element of Negroes, as they are on guard around whites. Uh, usually Negroes know that when this bourgeois Negro walks through the door, he is not doing something that he's initiated himself, but he's involved in something in which the white man is the absolute author of and has sent him to the Negro community for some information. And when they give that Negro some information, usually they give him the information that they want, the white, want him to take back to the white man, because that's who he's going to take it back to. Welcome to the door.com. The door, it's a platform where you can buy and send anything, anytime, anywhere, today. making money. It's swift, secure, and easy. Dad all, transforming lives.